Stephen Hawking has been referred to by the New York Times as the most revered scientist since Einstein. He's been professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge for over 30 years. His book, The Brief History of Time, sold over 9 million copies. In his latest book, The Grand Design, Hawking says quantum physics renders philosophy dead, theology pointless, and a creator unnecessary. He has astounded the philosophical community by making the audacious claim, Traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. What Hawking fails to acknowledge is that science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Science is defined by philosophy. What science is, how it functions, and what limits constrain it are each features of philosophy, not of science itself. Hawking has placed his faith in the philosophy of naturalistic materialism, which is the belief that all that exists are matter and energy governed by natural law. Any view that does not conform to naturalistic materialism is not scientific. Now, Hawking and others would have us believe that science has somehow disproved religion. But this is not possible. Science cannot disprove the supernatural. Now, in this situation, can Stephen Hawking measure the temperature of the space chicken with a yardstick? Of course not. Does that prove that the chicken has no temperature? No. In the same manner, does science measure the natural or the supernatural? Science measures the natural. Then it can't even in principle, rule out the possibility of the supernatural. Just as the limitations of a yardstick can't rule out the possibility of the chicken having heat. This is called a category error. The demise of philosophy aside, Hawking necessarily robs its grave as his book is a case in point material reductionist philosophical treatise, not hard science at all. He sets forth the preposterous idea that the mere existence of the law of gravity allows that the universe could spontaneously create itself out of nothing. He argues that the entire universe is the product of an arbitrary quantum fluctuation an unintentional cosmic coincidence that has no spiritual significance. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me get this straight. In other words, to create itself, the universe had to exist before it existed. Now that's futile thinking. I guess Hawking's grand design is actually no design. But how grand is that? Yet, still he must acknowledge that we find an astonishingly well-suited set of conditions for life. The fine-tuning of the universe truly transcends credulity, and he knows it. To explain away the inconceivable precision design that we encounter, Hawking asserts, But just as Darwin and Wallace have explained that the apparently miraculous design of living forms could appear without the intervention by a supreme being, the multiverse concept can explain the fine-tuning of physical law without the need for a benevolent creator who made the universe for our benefit. Multiple universes? But where did they come from? Bodies such as stars or black holes cannot just appear out of nothing, but the whole universe can. Wow! That sounds like magic! Wait a minute, seriously, how can nothing fluctuate? Nothing literally means no thing. 
it cannot do anything. But Hawking believes that nothing did something which made everything. That's futile thinking. It seems as if a famously brilliant scientist is exhibiting embarrassingly futile thinking. Now, I think I know why. I've been reading A.W. Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy, which is a book about the attributes of God and how many modern Christians have lost their proper sense of God's awesome majesty. I highly recommend it, and I hope that you might read it. In light of Hawking's nonsense, a few sections really stood out to me. So much so, I feel compelled to talk about them. First, Tozier speaks to the fact that modern man has lost his proper sense of awe and wonder for creation, remarking on how much still we do not know. Secularism, materialism, and the intrusive presence of things have put out the light in our souls and turned us into a generation of zombies. We cover our deep ignorance with words, but we are ashamed to wonder. We are afraid to whisper mystery. I think this is indeed the case. One's belief in God is inextricably related to one's sense of awe and wonder with creation. The arrogance of some scientists is rather astonishing considering that we actually know so very little. Hozier's words, still we do not know, were penned decades ago. Has science proven him wrong? Has science now unlocked reality? Actually, quite the opposite. In fact, we've actually learned recently that we know a lot less than we thought we did in 1961. As David Spurgle, the leader of the Wilkinson Microwave Anastropy Probe Space Mission, reveals, From our experiments, the periodic table which composes the atoms of normal matter that are said to make up the entire universe actually covers only 4.5% of the whole. Students are learning just a tiny part of the universe from their textbooks. It would be dark matter and dark energy that comprise the next 22% and 73.5% of the universe. Now, like the example with the chicken and the yardstick, we can see that Hawking is making a category error. Philosopher of science, Dr. John Lennox, has astutely rebutted Hawking, saying, What Hawking appears to have done is to confuse law with agency. His call on us to choose between God and physics is a bit like someone demanding that we choose between aeronautical engineer Sir Frank Whittle and the laws of physics to explain the jet engine. Now, Dr. Lennox is indeed correct, and this is where my current reading of Tozier connected serendipitously. I had just heard Lennox's rebuttal when I read this section by Tozier. One cannot read the scriptures sympathetically without noticing the radical disparity between the outlook of the men of the Bible and that of modern men. We are today suffering from a secularized mentality. Where the sacred writers saw God, we see the laws of nature. Their world was fully populated. Ours is all but empty. Their world was alive and personal. Ours is impersonal and dead. God ruled their world. Ours is ruled by the laws of nature, and we are always once removed from the presence of God. And what are these laws of nature that have displaced God in the minds of millions? Law has two meanings. One is all external rule enforced by authority, such as the common rule against robbery and assault. The word is also used to denote the uniform way things act in the universe. But the second use of the word is erroneous. What we see in nature is simply the paths God's power and wisdom take through creation. Properly, these are phenomena, not laws, but we call them laws by analogy with the arbitrary laws of society. Science observes how the power of God operates, discovers a regular pattern somewhere, and fixes it as a law. The uniformity of God's activities in His creation enables the scientist to predict the course of natural phenomena. The trustworthiness of God's behavior in His world is the foundation of all scientific truth. 
Upon it, the scientist rests his faith, and from there, he goes on to achieve great and useful things in such fields as those of navigation, chemistry, agriculture, and the medical arts. When I consider Lennox's observation of the category era, coupled with Tozier's prescient theological analysis, I think Hawking's descent comes into sharp focus. In a brief history of time, Hawking invoked God and the mind of God as an overarching rationality governing the universe. Now, how can we account for an otherwise brilliant man's descent into self-refuting nonsense? The Old Testament is crystal clear on atheism. But Romans chapter 1 actually prescribes specific consequences that aptly characterize Hawking's latest book. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Futile thinking, indeed. <laughs>